Most Holy Father, we humbly approach thy throne of glory and grace to thank thee for the way of life that thou hast given us in Christ and the gospel. We're thankful for the night of rest and for this day in which we can assemble to study thy word and the hour to follow this, to worship thee in spirit and in truth. May we day by day yield our bodies living sacrifices unto thee, which is our reasonable service. And we'll search the scriptures and rightly divide the word of truth that we might renew our minds to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Help us to have a proper perspective of this life, to know it's a time to get ready for eternity. And may we not become entangled in the affairs of this world that we lose sight of the most important thing, and that is spiritual living. Gracious Father, defeat us in evil and raise us up in good. Help us to love the truth and love thee with all we have and are, to love our brethren and to love our neighbors ourselves. Defeat us in evil. God us always to help each other to understand the truth and to live it. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, to remind ourselves in our little drill we do, there are three great dispensations of time that God has dealt with man. Patriarchal age, your father rule period, going about 2,500 years. As far as the Bible is concerned, it starts in Genesis 1, verse 1. It goes down to the giving of the law of Moses to the children of Israel through on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20. Then you have the Mosaical section where God gave the law of Moses, as I said, to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5, and they... Continue in that as a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 24. Until the cross, where Colossians 2, 14 tells us the law was nailed to the cross. And then the church started in the Christian age in Acts chapter 2 on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. And that's been going in the Christian age for almost 2,000 years. It is the last dispensation of time in which God will deal with man, offering man salvation. So the design and purpose of life in the flesh on this earth is to get man ready for eternity. When we leave this world, there won't be any other state of existence or place of existence where we can get ready to please God. God in His complete justice through Christ Jesus, the judge, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. There is no other time to get ready for that than now. In the two great ages that we've been studying preceding the Christian age, then that was um, coming down through human history, the gradual revelation of how God would save man through Jesus Christ. And we ought to realize that in studying anything through the Old Testament. That is a gradual revealing in history, past, time, and space, of the scheme of redemption. So we've looked over all of that. And we've noticed that without going into detail, that marriage, the home, well, first of all, just the creation itself, material things, uh, the creation of man and woman, marriage, the home, and so forth, are presented there in the first few chapters. I again want to emphasize that in studying with people today and trying to convert them to Christ, that it is good to begin with the book of Genesis. That is, what's the meaning of Genesis? Well, it's beginning. There we find the beginning. Or origins, you'll see it both talk about the origin of everything. Now, when I say the origin of everything, of course, we're talking about the material creation. We're talking about all natural laws and so forth that fit this creation to make it function. We saw also that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, is, He reveals Himself in the New Testament, or the first, second, and person of the Godhead, the one great essence God in three persons, first, second, and third person were all active in the creation. For sake of, um, again, trying to understand deity on our finite, which means limited level, then we see there are certain roles, for lack of a better way to put it, of 
the Godhead. And we see Christ as the executor of the Father's will. That's made very clear in the New Testament. Now, understand, we have the New Testament to help us in understanding the Old Testament. For thousands of years, and especially this patriarchal period, they, had, they didn't even have a written law. Remember that. Thing was, things were done on a local level and more local than that, the, the family. So the father, the patriarch, was the priest. He was the prophet. He was the one that directed all things. No written law, I say. But then when we come to the law of Moses, we have the people of God, the messianic people, the messianic nation formed. What is characteristic of a nation, this nation or any other, for it to exist? Right, her ruler, law, territory, and people. <laughs> so do you see that in the formation of the nation of Israel? You do, don't you? They all had the same thing. It took a while to form it. They, they got their law many years before they got their country. Now, question, why... We haven't got to, to over there yet, sort of. This is sort of the borderline of it. Why did the children of Israel wander 40 years in the wilderness? Well, sin, I don't know who said what. Their, their sin, lack of faith in God, lack of, lack of taking God at His word because He is God and all that that implies. That's what they did. And that was at the point to where he said, you will wander then in this wilderness till everybody's dead, in which 20 years old and upward that left Egypt. And, of course, the only two that uh, was in that category that made it into the land of Canaan were who? Joshua and Caleb. So God is forming a nation. It's interesting. You know, have you noticed that, and I wish we could impress this upon ourselves, it would help us a lot in our day-to-day -day living and dealing with things as Christians in the Lord's church. Time doesn't figure in on God's determination of when he's going to do things. Now, I'm not saying by that is that he doesn't have a time in which a certain thing can happen. But when he talks about things at hand, at whose hand? What is, let me ask you this. What is time to God? God didn't experience since last Sunday all the days that we've gone through. Now, I've got to qualify that because he's fully aware of <laughs> who made the days, who made the time. God did. But yet, what is it to him? It doesn't control him. The only way it controls him is that when he made time to function in a certain way, he works within that certain way in which he made it. So he deals with us. But as far as he's concerned... Time doesn't have anything to do with it. That's hard to understand, but that's the best way to try to conclusion you can come to. Now, one of the big things that comes out of, of Genesis, and we've mentioned that, is, is sin is the transgression of the law. Now, we read that in 1 John 3 and verse 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is lawlessness. What do you have in the garden? From God for Adam and Eve. You have law. What is it? That's one of them. Are there others? What came before that? They were to keep the garden. That was their duty. Is that a law? Certainly it is. Now here's the difference in the law and the what is involved. Evidently left up to a great extent to man's own judgment, Adam and his own judgment as to the keeping of the garden, what was necessary and so forth. What we don't see sometimes that ought to be emphasized about eating of the tree of uh, good and evil. Verse 17, uh, chapter 2, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
Did he give that to Adam and Eve originally or to Adam? He gave it to Adam. Wonder how Eve got it. He had a responsibility. He's, the head. He's, he's not only the head of his family, he's the head of the human race. Not any other man in the world but Adam. Period. Uh, what color was his hair? Black. How do you know that? You don't. Nobody does. It was the color of his hair. That's what it was. Whatever color that was, I don't know. What was the color of his skin? We don't know. But we don't know. If you don't, remember this, if you don't have the facts stated by God, you don't know. So, I don't know. Nobody else knows. So it's not a matter of just saying you're an ignorant person. Everybody's ignorant about that. By the way, the word ignorant just means I don't know. I don't have the information. One time I was preaching in a place since I said that, and I would refer a lot of times to what Paul said. Paul used the word ignorance a lot in saying, I want you to be enlightened. I would not have you without knowledge. So he would say, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. He didn't say, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren. But he said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Well, he just simply meaning, I want you to know what you need to know. And we all operate that way. But I kept doing that one time, and one of the elders came up, and he says, why do you have you got to use the word ignorant so much? Well, I, you know, sometimes you want to say, is that bothering you? But uh, the point is, it was a chance to teach. You, thought, you would think as a person, as an elder, in reading the New Testament, being able to meet the qualifications, would realize that all that's being said is, I want you to be enlightened. Why do we have the Bible? Because without it, we are ignorant. There's nothing wrong with saying I'm ignorant. It may hurt your pride to say you're ignorant, but if you don't say you're ignorant, you're more ignorant than what you think you are. So uh, that's just one of the things, and we ought not be afraid of it. Now, can it be used as derision? Of course it can be. Anything can be. Yes. Well, that's exactly right. And then I'd add one more thing to that. When it comes to things of God, he's made it clear that if he doesn't reveal it, what? Certain things. You can't know it. So we're always going to be in ignorance. But that comment you made is saying where you can be enlightened, you ought to be laboring to be enlightened. Well, I, but the thing about it is we're all ignorant of a lot of things. I don't care how long you study and how well you specialize. One fellow said getting a Ph.D. <laughs> he says you got you know, get a Ph.D., you have to zero in a right on one little bitty research subject. Which means you may know a whole lot about that, but you may not know much about anything else. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, it's the, it's, it's the nature of research because you can't know everything about everything. So you have to decide what you're going to, to know and be willing to read and study to learn. Well, back to then these things. Why are we in this class? Why are we studying these things? There are certain basic things that need to undergird our general approach to regular Bible study, which we all know the Bible says, because it's God's Word, that to know Him, we have to study the Scriptures. If you continue in my Word, Jesus says, what? That's right. Then you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. So we study. We study continually. Now, sin then is transgression of the law. And here's the peculiar thing about don't eat of this tree of knowledge. That, well, let me ask you to see what you think. What do you think is the difference in that law, besides it being a prohibition, an emphatic prohibition, with consequences stated if you violate it. And the other general law of your put in this garden that I've given you to dress and keep it and all the multitudinous things that be involved in their day-to-day -day activity in dressing and keeping that garden. What's the difference in the laws?
Well, that's true, but what's the difference in categorizing these two laws? Can we categorize them? What is the difference in this one that says, but of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, thou shalt not die of it, for in the day of thy thou shalt surely die, over and against the general thing, law, of taking care of the garden and the expediencies of how you go about doing it? Well, that's just, there's still commandments. So what's the difference in the commandments? What? Both are laws. When God said you go in there and dress and keep that garden, that's God giving you a direct statement to do what it was necessary to dress and keep the garden, <coughs> period. But then he says, Now the tree of knowledge, good and evil, thou shalt not eat thereof, but the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's just a fruit like any other fruit. Well, yeah, that's the difference in negative and positive. It's still not it. You're forgetting a whole lot of what we've already studied a lot of times. True. And, and that's true of any law God gives man, whether it's don't or do. That's not what I'm after. Not what I'm after. <laughs> You're getting a little closer. It is a pure positive law. It, pure po what do I mean by pure positive law? The thing's right for one reason and one reason only. Why? God said don't do it. That's the reason it separates itself from all the other General laws of whatever necessary to keep the garden, you must do it. That's still a must. But this kind of law says can be right for one reason, one reason only. One reason, one reason only. What is it? God said do it. They can eat of the other fruits of the garden. Now, can anybody give me other examples we've used many times to emphasize pure, positive law? Knowing the ark. What about, what about Abraham commanded to do what? No, not that. Not, not necessarily Abraham offering his son Isaac. God... See, this is the thing about pure positive law. In other places, God may have condemned you for doing that. Does God approve of a man taking his son, killing him as an offering sacrifice? Why was it right with Abraham and Isaac? You can only answer one reason. God said so. These laws, and I mark this down, these laws truly test your faith, your confidence, your trust in God and His Word. Because there's no other way they can be right except what? God said so. Dip seven times in the river Jordan, Naaman, and you'll have your leprosy cleansed when you come up the seventh time. Why? If you had leprosy right now and went to the river Jordan and dipped seven times, you'll come up with leprosy. Maybe worse if you get in the muddy river. <laughs> so why was it right? Because God said so. You say, well, the whole Bible is because God said so, but everything in the Bible that authorizes us to act and is obligatory doesn't always test our faith. What's the greatest example today? The plan of salvation. You've got to hear the word and understand it. The evidence therein convinces you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're commanded, Acts 1730, to repent of your sins. You're also taught to confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. Where is the whole religious world around you that says God is God and the Bible's the Bible and the Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior? Where do they stumble? Why? There's no logical or visible connection between dipping in water and God saying your sins are forgiven. So why is it right? God said so. This tests your faith in God because He is God and all that it means. For the reason. And so I suggest to you in part of your study you go through, whether it's patriarchal, mosaic, or Christian, and ask yourself the question, which ones of these laws of God are positive law? I'll leave the word pure off. We'll just leave it positive law. I might ask this. We've already studied it, but backing up. What is codified law? Written law. 
Now, in the patriarchal age, we've learned what? <coughs> there wasn't any written law. Well, in Hebrews 1, in verse 1, God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So now what's happening? But in these last days hath spoken unto us by his Son. So God was headed for there, wasn't he? Fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, Galatians 4 and 4. And John 1, 1, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. Glory was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Titus 2 teaches us that grace came teaching us. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we shall live righteously, godly, and soberly in this present world, in this present age, this Christian age. This is it. You prove to God you love Him now, that you do things because God said so, that you take it by faith, by His Word, or you don't. And if you don't, what's coming for you? The fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For our God is a consuming fire, is the approach the Hebrews writer came. In other words, there's not going to be any more coming to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden on the day of judgment. That's one thing that will not be uttered by our Lord on the day of judgment. What will be uttered is, Come thou blessed of my Father, or depart from me, I never knew you. Period. Each person judged upon his own way he lived in his life, according to the teaching of the Bible. So early on, let us get in mind the difference in positive law and his law in general. It's simply an effort in systematizing law. It doesn't change a thing. God's law means it's to be done by us. But there are certain parts of God's law, God's law that really tries your faith. And you can just all the excuses of people who don't want to believe baptism is for the remission of sins, the only way to become a Christian the doorway into Christ. And you'll say, but I think God could do it this way. I think God, well, Abraham could have said the same thing. Hey, Lord, can't you do it some other way? But when you see Abraham commanded to take thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest, and offer him a burnt offering. You ever notice he ne there's nothing, no question. There's no record that Moses gives us of Abraham saying, oh, I got to think about this many. He didn't question him. He bargained with him. Well, yeah, but I'm, well, my point is that we know that if he, if he did have a different opinion. <laughs> I know you're having trouble finding out language. Well, as, so, I mean, if his uh, desires were different than what God was commanding him to do, he was of a mind. But that ought to tell us something about the differences in the commandment God gave to him to, get, to offer his son as a as a burnt offering, and in dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm just saying that we know that Abraham would speak of this man. The question about this man. It's in the nature of the commandment given to him as to whether he would question anything. God told him what he was going to do, uh, and Abraham had no part in it when he was going to Sodom and Gomorrah. He just said, I'm going over there to destroy them. And he said, but wait, wait a minute, Lord. Would you destroy them if there were so many left in there? Uh, and, and, of course, there wasn't, which tells us something about when God chooses to exercise punishment on people, uh, judge them. So it's, it's not a matter of him saying to God about Isaac, um, well, let's, let's go out here and get, why can't, why, can't, why can't we have a lamb? That's what we normally use. Because when God specified Isaac and said, go do it, there wasn't, there wasn't any bargaining room. There wasn't any bargaining room at all. And there's, I think it's significant the Bible doesn't realize, uh, doesn't uh, reveal that he bargained with him. It is a test of his confidence in God that God knew what he was doing because he's God. Because I'll show you what he did do, and the writer of Hebrews tells us this in Hebrews 11. And what did he do concerning, this may be 
the key to the whole thing. What did he do? Yeah, in his mind, uh, God will raise him from the ashes of the, uh, of the offer, offering and go ahead and perform what he had promised to Abraham that he would, through Isaac, perform. Abraham knew. I mean, this is an absolute fact. Abraham took God at his word, and when it came to the promises that would be fulfilled only through Isaac, Isaac had to live. Whether he came back from the dead or what, Isaac had to live. Why? Well, through, first of all, I'll make, through him I'll make of you a great nation that you can't count, be like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the seashore. Next of all, through his seed singular, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Isaac must live. That's the implication, by the way. You wonder what implication is? There it is. In his mind, he knew immediately. By implication, this man, my son must live. He must live. So I'm going to take and do what God said because he's God. He knows what he's doing. I don't. That way, you know, we'd all be a lot better off if we'd say God knows what he's doing, but I don't. That helps you take him at his word. So let's keep in mind right at the beginning in the book of Genesis, the book of Origins, and this, this general laws of God that Adam and Eve were expected, were obligated to keep in the dressing and to keep in the garden over and against the one law. And why do you think then that it focuses immediately on this one prohibition? Because that's how man is separated from God. That's where he's headed to show us the first sin. No indication that they failed in their general keeping of the commandments to dress and keep the guard. They sure failed on this one. I think it's interesting, verse 17 of Genesis 3, he tells Adam that, and then immediately verse 18 he says, And the Lord God said, It's not good to be alone. I'll make him meat suitable for him. By the way, let's don't say help meat unless we're thinking help suitable. That's what it means. The woman is a help that is suited for man, period. And out of the ground, uh, the Lord formed every beast of the field, and so on goes on down here and tells about the creation of woman. Then immediately it goes in chapter 3 where? Immediately. Knowing there were no chapters and verses in the original writing of Moses. Where does it focus? It goes right into through the, what temptation is and the sin right into her sin. Now, it's important for us to look at this for a moment. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And people immediately want to do what we sadly do. Think of things as they are now and look at it as if that's it was then. In evolution, they have a doctrine. The doctrine of uniformitarianism. Anybody know what it is? Uniformitarianism. Yeah, in other words, in the beginning, everything functioned to, uh, then as they do now. But what do you find when you go back, the first thing in verse 1 of chapter 3? It's totally different from now. Totally different. The serpent spoke. He talked. What did the serpent look like then? What was he like? I don't know. Nobody knows. I, get I still don't understand how Clark, in his Old Testament commentary, and he, it's quite a good commentary. It's old. It goes back, I guess, what, 1700, 1600, when it was. Now, this shows you where people, <laughs> people go and they start speculating. He thinks, the serpent was an orangutan. <laughs> and I, I can't hardly read that without laughing every time I read it. Now tell me how on the face of the globe you would ever come up with whatever the serpent was and why if you did, would you come up with an orangutan? I don't know. But it shows you that without revelation, even some of the best scholars in the world can come up with some mighty strange things. Well, let me ask you, what was it? What did it look like? I don't know. I have no idea. No idea, just like I don't know what Adam and Eve looked like, what color their hair was, what color their skin was. Yes, ma'am. Whatever 
where it was, it was standing on its feet. That's exactly right. I've never seen a snake do that. I've seen sometimes them rare up. I've seen them make me stand on my feet and, and, and make a lot of tracks. <laughs> I've, I remember one time down behind the house, Daddy had about a quarter acre and purple piece planted. Down below that was a, a plum thicket. I was always down there carrying on. We had a bunch of batty chickens that were roosting plum thicket, and I'd run them out every once in a while. So I was down there one day, and those peas were almost knee high. There was a king snake. At the time I saw it, I think it was far from here. <laughs> Not long, of course he wasn't. But he was probably about this long. He rolled up under my feet, and I was probably about two feet in the air before I came down. <laughs> and I knew what he was. I, I know the difference in snakes. and I, Snakes like that don't bother me. I'm glad they're around because king snakes will hunt up poison snakes and eat them. So I'm glad they're around. But any snake may make me hurt myself. <laughs> And uh, so I understand, but do, do I think when I, when I see the snakes today, whatever they are, do I think it was like this? Not at this point. It certainly wasn't. So I don't know what it was like. And the other thing is it says I know it wasn't like today is because the woman just had to care to a conversation with it. My grandmother thought any snake was poisonous. And by their back door, or somewhere real close by, there was always a hole, my garden hole. My grandfather kept every blade on the place, sharp as it could be. You wanted to be very careful. And if she ever found any poor little old snake, it could be six inches long or six feet long. Before she got through with it, there was not a, anything left. Nothing could wiggle on it when she got through with it, because it just nothing there joined together to wiggle. So she was scared of everything. I mean, making difference. But it wasn't like this. Nothing like this. Now, I don't understand if you say this Bible is the Word of God written to enlighten us, and this is about the beginning. Why can't we realize what I've just read? That we'll never know what that thing looked like, but it was totally different from anything we know now and call a serpent. Totally different. So, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And of course, the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Why is the serpent doing this? Because the devil has taken possession. The devil is in it. I don't know what all that means in the sense of what the serpent looked like, but uh, the biggest mistake she made was ever talking the thing in the first place. Especially when he starts uh, trying to say, well, yes, I know that's what you said God said, but anytime that comes up, run. All right, for God, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's, knowing good from evil. In other words, he begins to create doubt in the mind. God's trying to hold something back from us that's good for us. I wonder how many sins in this world have been committed because somebody thought, well, I don't know. I, I need to know that, and they're trying to do something to stop me from knowing it, or something like that. Well, notice how it worked, and you see the nature of the way we all come into sin, in most cases. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Well, let me ask you something. The first thing it says about this fruit is that good for food. Well, that's all right. I understand how something like that, by the very nature of a fruit, could look good to eat. Pleasant to the eyes, I can understand how that appeals to how I look at it. But a tree to be desired to make one wise, I don't understand that that well. I've never seen a banana I thought would make me wise. I've never seen an apple I thought would make me wise. So what all is involved in that, I wonder? I don't know, but something different. So she took the fruit there, and did eat, and gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and, that they, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Why are we ashamed of our nakedness? What? In our nature? 
wasn't in their nature before they sinned. They had the same nature before the sin they had after they sinned. Because before they sinned, they were innocent. What does that mean? They had no sin. Well, yeah, that's right. They had no sin. That's right. <laughs> but, well, it's obvious something happened to them that would be hard for us if, I don't know that we could ever figure it out, that when they violated this law, took of the fruit, God said, don't. What, that, did, what, did the, what was the tree, um, what power was it given in just what we were, it told them the difference between good and evil? I don't know that it, that it did in and of itself alone. It's the fact they violated God's will is what did this. Can you remember that in your life? When you when you didn't know it was wrong to be naked and then you knew it was right. Well, no, right. because that was at least sixty two or sixty three years ago. I don't know when but see, this is, that's right, and I wanted you to say that because it's true of every one of us. You can't remember when you were innocent like that. You, you, I, anybody here think they can? I, I can't. I mean, I remember how old I was at a certain time, and it must have been that way, but I don't, I don't remember. That one right there is innocent. He doesn't know. He <laughs> doesn't know naked from not naked. So he doesn't mind taking his diaper off and hanging around and it's not gonna bother <laughs> anything in the world, it doesn't bother him at all. But I, but there's something happens in our growth and development now that we reach a stage, mental and so forth and all of it put together, but where we know the difference and we see them when we do. But back here you've got grown people who are innocent. That were in the same position. Yeah. And I don't understand how that can be, but it was, and the point is, is that when the transgression came immediate realization came on their part. Uh, how it all happened, I, I don't know, but it happened immediately. Um, notice verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and made them those aprons. The point I'm making is one's nakedness is connected with the fact that we in sinning stand naked before God and ashamed before God. Sometimes we don't see in this the impact of sin. Sin makes one uh, ashamed. People may not realize it, but sin does. It makes one ashamed. If you've got a person that doesn't believe in God and he's brought to proper belief in God, then he's taught to proper belief in the Bible and, and Christ and the gospel, and he obeys it. When he obeys it from the heart, the whole inward man's involved, intellect, rational, feelings, and emotions, and all of that, will. Then there's, look at the transition, great transitions made from when back he didn't believe in God to now he's a New Testament Christian. He's going to look at things totally different, isn't he? Will, will he be ashamed? He might not have been. Yes. Will he prize that now, which one time he would not have prized? Will his value system be changed? With his ethics and morals, outlook on religion, will it all be changed? Because he will have learned that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions, keep oneself unspotted from the world. That last part's a multitudinous thing. But the point is, you have to become enlightened to have certain attitude changes. There's no way around it. You can't just say to a person who is in poverty, who's there through no fault of their own, I feel your pain. And it's all fixed. You can't do it. Now, if you really feel somebody's hurt, I put feeling quotes. Then James takes over in James 2. What does he say? A 
That's right, your faith is dead. You can acknowledge that you ought to. You can acknowledge it's God's will that you do it. You can acknowledge you're in need of it. But if you don't do it, what good is it? And that's exactly the reasoning that James does. It needs to fit even right here. And we'll look at it just for a moment. If a brother or sister be naked, naked, and destitute of daily food, well, there are people like that. A lot more in the world than we realize because of where we live. But notice he says, brother or sister, your brethren in Christ, naked and destitute of daily food. They don't have food for the day. And one of you, you Christians, say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warm and filled. In other words, sure hope it works out for you. Be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? How have they been helped? Now, I'm not talking about the social gospel that says all there is to the gospel is to feed the poor. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about a benevolent arm of the church which says there's the milk of human kindness exemplified on the part of Christians. Christian means of Christ. It shows your concern for others in dire straits. And you see the Lord doing that all the time. So a faithful person is a person that sees the plight of a person and then seeks to alleviate the problem. And there's no use saying you're faithful if you don't seek to alleviate the problem. The world's lost in sin. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Most people are going to go to hell. Well, what are you trying to do about it? Well, I, I can't reach all the people in the world, so I don't do anything. But you can do what you can where you are. God never expected everybody. To, I'm not accountable for all the sins of the people in China. Neither are you. But I'm expected as a member of the Lord's church and all that that means to be mindful of the fact God cooperates with the spiritual body of the church to get the gospel, God's power to save, to everybody. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's my responsibility, Well. Uh, as I said, the Greek there in Mark 16, 15 says, As ye are going. Yes, there can be specific efforts of a church to send somebody to a certain country and do all that's necessary to get that person fitted to work in that country. I understand that. But it's also saying to every member of the church, wherever you go, as you go, whatever reason you're going, then you're going to teach the truth wherever you are. That's how God intended the world to be converted to Christ. It's wherever you are, you're spreading the gospel. It's not like saying, well, I'm sorry the world's lost in sin, but I can't save the whole world, so why start? That's, that's never in the mind of a faithful child of God as the New Testament describes that faith. But you can see how that people can let such as that deceive them just as this deceived, deceived um, Eve. Now, I want to spend a little more time on this, as time will allow. Because sometimes I've seen, I even heard a preacher that I thought a lot of and still do uh, make a mistake one time because it was pointed out to him that just in casual conversation actually it wasn't anybody trying to teach anybody anything necessarily at that time save what you might glean from a discussion that uh, Adam was not deceived well we emphasize so much that Eve was deceived she heard a lie she believed the lie she obeyed a lie she was separated from God immediately spiritually <laughs> gradually but Adam was not deceived. This is what Paul said. By the way, the same Holy Spirit, same third person of the Godhead that Moses to write Genesis has inspired Paul to write this. He does this in 1 Timothy chapter 2 where he's talking about women and their work. Verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. And American Sanders says exercise dominion over the man, but to be in silence. That silence there, well, we won't go to that right now. As far as not where I'm going, take me away too far. For Adam was first formed in Eve. You know, God just doesn't take up space. There's a reason for Adam, that we're informed for Adam's first formed in Eve. What is that telling you about Adam's role in this world of mankind? He was ahead. And Adam was not. Now, I don't know how this preacher that long missed things, but that's an explicit statement. Adam was not deceived. 
How do you become deceived? You believe a lie. And the lie that constitutes sin. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Well, I thought Adam transgressed. It says the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Sir? Well, he had an obligation to perform as the head of the human race, the head of his wife, to stop that kind of stuff. That was his responsibility. He, he didn't. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. We won't get into verse 15 right now. So the meaning of the point I'm trying to get over here is that Adam was not deceived. He did not believe a lie. He did not obey a lie. That Adam sinned. Because he did. <laughs> well, he took of the thing and ate it. That's how he sinned. He ate what God said, you shall not eat for when you eat, you will die. He didn't have to be deceived. That tells us two things. I can be deceived by believing a lie, whatever works on me to get me to believe a lie. And James deals with that too. And break the law of God. Or I can just go into it with my eyes wide open like Adam did and do what I shouldn't do. Either way, what have I done? You sin. Because sin is what? The transgression of the law. So either way, that's what happened. Now, who is the head of the human race? Adam. Adam's the head of the human race. Do you think, do you think that the serpent was after Eve only or after Adam ultimately? Adam. He wanted the head of the human race. Now, Paul, I'm not going to give it to you right now. Paul has something to say in 1 Corinthians about, about man and woman and about this sin. So you might write that down, go look over there and see what Paul said as he applied it to the situation at Corinth. Now, the doorway was open for sin to come into the world. Don't know that I understand anything about that. But I know it made it possible by their doing what they did in violation of God's law for Satan to have access to every one of us. Thus Paul would say in Romans 3.23 what? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Is that what God said in the beginning? Whether you've been deceived or whether you just did it, period, you still sin. There are a lot of people today who think they're serving God in, like God wants them to, who are assembled to worship God, and in every bit of it, they're engaged in sin. But they may not be deceived. They just do it because that's what they've always done and they think that's what God wants them to do and it doesn't make any difference what they do. On the other hand, there are people who have been deceived and they sin. But either way, they've transgressed God's law. That can happen with a lot of folks. And that's the reason in trying to convert folks, especially out of the denominational world, that you've got to realize people can engage in sin sincerely. And they do. But it also could happen to you and me. We can engage in sin through our ignorance. There's that bad word again. <laughs> through our ignorance, we can engage in it and never think anything about it but sin. Because what did the prophet Hosea say? My people are what? For lack of knowledge. What if I were to say my people are destroyed for ignorance? Would that work all right? Might not sound good to a certain person, but <laughs> that's what you're saying. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed because they're ignorant of the things they need to know how to please God. And they're not, they're not doing what's necessary to enlighten themselves. So how much throughout the Old and New Testament are we taught to study, 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 spend time, 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 right attitude, 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 right attitude toward the truth before we ever start studying? How much is that said one way or the other? Directly or indirectly implied. It just permeates the Bible. And so to be enlightened, we've got to know the Bible. 
You just have to. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And it's a never-ending process. So, since the transgression of the law, God gave this law that tried their faith in Him, Adam and Eve, that is. They transgressed it, Genesis 2, 15 through 17, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And again, I want to emphasize, this was the result of hearing, believing, and obeying a lie on her part. Then he just took it, regardless of what God said, and violated God's law. Now, the other thing is that ought to be established in people's minds when you're trying to study with them, and why not better do it in the study of Genesis, is that sin does not go unpunished. I suggest to you today there's a whole host of folks that have worked it out in their minds that, uh, you know, it's not going to be so bad to be, to die contrary to God's will, living contrary to God's will. That's not so. In chapter 3, in your book, I, I, that's listed there, chapter 3, 8, <clears throat> 8 through 19, you have the whole story told. First of all, they were ashamed for reasons we've already discussed in violating God's will. And they're trying to hide from God. Do you think there are people in this world today who may believe in God, they think they can hide from Him? Of course they do. Now we can talk about the human nature from the standpoint of the sinful person. What is the nature of a human who knows he or she has sinned, transgressed God's law? What do they do? They have two courses to follow. Seek God to find forgiveness of sins or what? Try to justify yourself in the sin. What are the courses there to follow? You either seek the remedy for sin or you seek to justify yourself in doing the sin. What happened in the garden when God confronted them? Adam, he approached the head of the human race. And the Lord God, verse 9, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now, let me ask you this. Was that because God didn't know? Here's a, a good lesson on hermeneutics. A lot of times in the Bible, things are presented from God's standpoint as if he did not know. Well, God's omniscient. There's nothing he doesn't know. Whatever's knowable is part of him. So why does he question like this? This is for, this is for his benefit. That is for Adam's benefit. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, before he partook of that truth, he had never been able to say that. The reality of it and the feelings and whatever all went on with it as far as being ashamed, he would never have said that. It would been impossible for him to say it. But now separated from God by sin, God, notice how God focuses in on him. Verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Now, there's a wealth of information in that question. Who told it? Who provided the information to you that you were naked? You didn't know it before. Now, why do you know it now? That's what I asked earlier. It's because of what happened to him in the process of sinning. There was a, a, a cutoff. There was a change of things. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat of it? Well, now God knew all along what was what. This is for Adam's benefit. It's making him focus in on what's going on. I suggest in teaching you do that a lot of times. You ask questions to make people think and to come to conclusions about things, and then hopefully they'll put it together and reason with it. And the man said, The woman by whom thou gavest to me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now notice, he's just asking questions, and he jumps into all this. Why does he do that? Notice verse 11. Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat of it? And the man said, The woman whom thou gave. He doesn't even say, Yes, I did. I sinned. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Immediately, what does he do? Blames the woman. Actually, what does he blame? Who does he blame? He blames God. But that's not the attitude that he had when she was created for him. The Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? She did play a part in it. God does turn to her. She was the instrument that Satan used to get to Adam. She has to bear that responsibility. All right. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. If you knew enough to know that he's beguiling you when you could quote the will of God back to him when he first asked, then you should have known enough to run. But she didn't. She listened because it appealed to her. 
and you had it brought out. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And my grandmother sharpened her hoe. <laughs> so that's when things changed. Things changed radically as to the serpent. Uh, what it looked like before, I don't know, but I know what serpents look like now. By the way, even among serpents, in their general way of appealing now, there's a lot of difference even in them. So, I won't go into this now because time's running out. Am I right? Have they, have they, they're already out? Good. Waiting is good to try and develop patience. 